Well, hello, Muscat. Wow, what an audience. And I hope you've enjoyed the whole day because you know, I've gone on this journey in life. I've gone on this journey in life and I feel like, okay, what can I do more? Where can my life take me? And this journey, it wasn't quite easy. And I'm th I wonder what you're all thinking. You're thinking, who is this handsome guy standing here on stage right here, right now? You know, this journey I've gone in life, it's not been easy. You know, in fact, I grew up in a very poor community in, uh, in East London. People hear about London generally around the world and go, oh, glitz and glamour, posh, fancy. You have any idea you can make it happen? But I look at London and the community I grew up in, and it was a very cultural community. In fact, uh, my parents are from Bangladesh. And this culture that we have in Bangladesh, which they brought over to London, in East London, where in fact they told me that without a university degree, you are deemed unsuccessful in this world. Okay, I need this degree in life to be deemed successful in this world. You know, here in Oman as well, I've met a few people and I've spoken to a few people online uh, via Facebook and uh, social media. And what they've told me is that, you know, when you're growing up and you have this idea, you know, your father has his business and suddenly he wants you to take over that business. He wants you to take over this business. Suddenly your dreams that you have are completely gone because you have to maintain your father's name or your grandfather's name. And my family, you know the culture I grew up in. My dad told me, my uncle told me, my relatives told me, without this degree you are deemed unsuccessful. And I was so into this mentality that I had to go into this education route, known as the matrix system, that I go to school, college, university, get this degree suddenly. Suddenly I've got this degree in life and I'm trying to find a job which doesn't really exist. Which doesn't really exist in London. And then I'm trying to find whatever job I've got. Let's say I've got landing myself a job. I've landed myself this job and suddenly my parents tell me it's marriage time. <laughs> you need to get married in life. Okay, I've got married, I have my own children. What happened? They go through the exact same process in life. So the element of freedom is completely lost. Mind you, I didn't follow that system because I always believe in breaking cultural barriers. To be able to say no. In fact, I own my own decisions. I have the right to make my own decisions. In fact, I am worth more than what society perceives me to be. You know, this cultural barrier. In fact, I stopped my education at the age of 18. I stopped my education at the age of 18. Initially, my parents were like, oh, it's the worst decision. In fact, I committed the biggest crime ever to not go to university. But there's a thing in this Bangladeshi culture that in fact without this degree you cannot get married. You know what they look at, arranged marriages, especially where my parents come from in Silet in Bangladesh is so huge, that love marriage is, is, a, is a crime, that everybody must have an arranged marriage. So I'm thinking I don't have a degree. And when they hand out these uh, photos and CVs uh, to, to get yourself a, a bride, that's what they do. They hand out photos and CVs. Now they look at my photo. If one day my parents decide that Sabrul, you're going to get an arranged marriage, that they hand out my photo and CV, they look at the photo and go, oh, beautiful guy. And they look at the CV and go, I'm no degree. <laughs> so they see no degree on me, does that mean I'm never going to get married? Oh, it would hurt me so much to think that that's the way the culture works. Now I always say to a lot of people that in fact you have to define, you have to make your, your new roots in culture because when you're, trying to, when you're trying to learn something that is so backdated that in fact culture, the Bangladeshi culture, the South Asian culture, our parents try to teach us what they've learned and what they've learned, they've learned off our grandparents. So it gets pushed down, down, down until a generation where we look at it and go, we're in 2013 and we have to learn something that is so backdated in the 1970s. Now, for a nation to evolve, we need young ideas, we need fresh ideas, we need people to be able to stamp their authority and say, this is who I am, this is what I represent, and this is what I want to accomplish in life. You know, I grew up in, uh, in a very poor community. In fact, I was diagnosed with epilepsy at the age of 11. At the age of 11, I'm diagnosed with epilepsy, and this dream I had one day, that I want to grow up and travel the world. I want to grow up and travel the world. Suddenly my doctor tells me because I've been diagnosed with epilepsy that my dream of traveling the world is completely over. That every time I go somewhere, my mommy must hold my hand. And it was very difficult to be able to accept that. Until I, uh, you know, I ran my first business at the age of 14, got into stock trading and everything. And I wrote my first book to be able to inspire young people. But these books that I wrote, you know, the first time I actually ever spent money, my parents have never worked. I spent money, paid around the equivalent, around 600 pounds, British pounds, to be on a magazine that went out to every single university across the UK. 
And for six months, I heard absolutely nothing. And I thought to myself, 600 pounds for the first time I choose to invest, having made this money through my ventures, I get no return. And then I get a phone call. I got a phone call from someone I would not have expected to get a phone call in my entire lifetime. And this was me at the age of 17. I got a phone call from the former first lady of Nigeria, the president's wife. The former president's wife says, Abdul, wow, I've read your article in this magazine, found it very inspiring. That in fact, she invited me to fly over to Nigeria to speak in front of three and a half thousand people. <sighs> Completely blew me away to think, how on earth did she get my number? But I realized something that, in fact, I was so excited, I accepted the invitation straight, ran downstairs to tell my mom, Mom, I've been invited to go to Nigeria. And her first response after she heard me say that was, Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> that Africa is too dangerous. You know, we get so blinded by what we see on the media, that whatever they say, you know, that, for instance, Africa, there's bombings everywhere, there's crime everywhere, they shouldn't go. And for me, I had a choice. I had a choice whether I should accept what my parents say, that this very backward-minded society or this you know, lack of education sometimes parents have, our grandparents have about the real world. I said, no, let me go and experience it for myself. Let me go experience it for myself. I flew over to Nigeria. I flew over to Nigeria, landed in Lagos Airport, went through immigration, collecting my luggage. The first step I took outside the airport, I'm looking up. And the first thing I saw when I stepped out of the airport was a massive billboard with my face on it. <laughs> Every kilometer I would drive by a huge billboard with my face on it saying nothing else but welcome to Nigeria, Sabirul. <gasps> I felt like a celebrity in a country I've never been to. Mind you, before that phone call, I didn't even know Nigeria existed. And for me, it was such an incredible thing. But it puts that one thing into perspective. In fact, I want to do so much for my community growing up in this small Bangladeshi community in East London. And every time I wanted to do something, I was constantly rejected by my, by my own community. Why? Because I wasn't an external influence. And that hurt me so much. And it put me into perspective, one thing, that you may not be always valued by your own community, that no matter what you want to do, your own community may not fully appreciate you for who you are. But that doesn't mean somebody halfway across the world won't absolutely admire and cherish the purpose of your existence in this world. And it woke me up to think, yes, I'm speaking in front of three and a half thousand people. But where my life absolutely changed was, in fact, there was 200 people only could fit inside the room. 3,300 were all outside pouring down with no shelter just to hear an 18-year-old guy talk. It completely blew me away. But in fact, there was this young Nigerian guy sitting in the audience who was, in fact, a drug addict. And because he saw that a 17-year-old could write his own book, that a book can be so successful, written by a young person, that he in fact, in fact six, uh, spent six months in rehab. Spent six months in rehab upon which he wrote his own book to, to teach other young people in Nigeria facing similar difficulties on how to combat drug addiction. Three months after that, he got out of rehab. He, he just saved up loose change here and there from doing small amounts of jobs for different people in his community. He saved up enough money to, on random Sunday morning, to get a UK visa, comes flying over to London on a random Sunday morning to come knocking on my door just to shake my hand and say the word, Sabiru, you have changed my life. And that completely blew me away. It completely blew me and made me realize one thing, that no matter how much fame, money, success you earn or achieve in life, you know, you will never have that feeling or emotion inside. Because it is absolutely priceless. And that is when a question struck me in life. A question struck me so philosophical that in fact not many of us even ask or dare to ask ourselves this question. When you leave this world, what will you be remembered for? <gasps> Now I was asked this, I asked myself this question, suddenly out of the blue, when you leave this world, what will you be remembered for? 
And for the first time I tried to answer that question, it was very difficult to be able to find solution. That in fact if I could make a difference in my small community in East London, in the UK, if I can go to a nation I've never even heard of make a difference, what is stopping me? Yes, I'm diagnosed with epilepsy, but still you're able to combat so much in life to prove people wrong. So what is stopping me from going halfway across the world, or if not traveling the entire world to be able to make a difference? to be able to make a difference and at the age of 20 in fact I won a global award called the JCI 10 Outstanding Young Person of the World Award and this award 4,000 people from 120 different nations all under the same roof and I said to myself I'm going to launch this this campaign here that I want to travel the world to be able to inspire 1 million people after giving the acceptance speech I just said the words can you help me can you help me to travel the world and inspire 1 million people and suddenly out of the blue I realized what the power of people meant. That in fact people don't necessarily buy into the idea. They buy into who you are, what you represent and the purpose of your existence because you want to give back to society. That in fact to be remembered for wanting to make a difference in this world holds so much more value in cars than having made a million bucks. Because that money doesn't go with you. And when I launched the campaign in uh, Japan, when I won the award in Osaka, Japan, it absolutely blew me away that in fact the first nation to come and uh, ask, uh, say that, yes, we'd love to host you in, uh, in our country was the Maldives. Now, most people go there on honeymoon, right? And I was there delivering events. In fact, I delivered 17 events in seven days in the Maldives in five different islands. And I was only aged uh, 20 at the time. And when I launched the first, it was in May 2011 that the first country took part. Then I realized something. That in fact, once one nation jumps on board, other nations started to come, you know, come on board and say, we'd like to host it even bigger, even better, and do exceptional things. And in fact, when I traveled to Botswana in October 2011, my only expectations were that I'd go to Africa. And uh, for the first time that I go to Africa and I'd be speaking at an, one or two events, let's see what happens, how the buzz happens. And I'm trying to make this difference. And I landed in Khabarone, in the capital of Botswana, and uh, the organizers put together 43 events in, t in the space of 12 days in 10 cities, literally 360 degree road trip across the entire country, as part of the Inspire One Million campaign. The support was immense. We have around about 300 or so people in this room. In Botswana, the population is 2 million. 200,000 people showed up just to hear a 21-year-old guy talk. And it completely blew me away. The, how much, how hungry people are for knowledge, how hungry people are for success, how hungry people are just to learn of you. And when I learned about the whole idea that believe in the power of people, in fact, uh, I've been now traveled to 26 countries as part of the Inspire One Million campaign. 26 countries since May 2011, 62 international visits. And in fact, having come here to Oman, I've just done an eight-day tour in Bangladesh, visiting uh, four different cities, and absolutely phenomenal. And the response you hear from people are crazy. Some come and say, you know, yes, we love you. In fact, I received over a thousand wedding proposals when I was in Bangladesh. <laughs> Quite remarkable and for me it kind of puts everything into perspective that when you value life so much it's not necessarily about doing things for yourself. When you give back to society absolutely priceless the journey they go, to, go through in life. There was one very funny message that I received via Facebook. In fact there was this young guy who drove two, three hundred kilometers just to come to one of, one of the events in Bangladesh. And he was sitting right at the back of the audience. After I spoke, everybody was coming out, signing autographs, taking photos, pictures. And he tried to push himself into the front of the queue. You know, and uh, after an event, the organizers grabbed me like this and took me out of the room because there was too many people surrounding me. And then he sent me a message on Facebook saying one thing. Sabrul, I've, sp and I've learned about you for the over past four or five years. You're absolutely in, you know, inspirational, my role model, etc. So I was sitting in the back of the room. Your talk was fantastic. But the one thing I most regret in life the one thing I most regret in life is the fact that I was not able to touch you. And I'm thinking, wow, is that how people perceive you in life when they see you as a role model, as an inspiration? And that taught me the element of respect. That when you gain this, this status in life that you want to give back to society, people respect you and see you as a role model. And in fact, parents look at you and say, I wish my son or daughter was like him or her. And it was absolutely amazing experience, this whole journey. In fact, uh, 
To give you the stats, 26 countries, 62 international visits. Maldives was the first country. Bangladesh was just a, a few days ago. In fact, the stats there are, are you know, it's just need to be updated a bit. Uh, 777 events I've delivered. 890,000 people have showed up as part of the Inspire 1 Million campaign in two years and four months that I've delivered. So if you put it into perspective, 300 people in the room, 890,000 people have showed up for the campaign. And you know, all of these people say to me, oh, it must have cost you a fortune. It must have you know, cost you so much money to make you know, become a reality. End of the day, when I believe in the power of people, that people, once they believe in who you are, what you represent, and what you want to accomplish in life, they would go to extreme lengths to make things happen. And I realized that the moment I was invited to go to Nigeria, that in fact one article that this, the former first lady read completely blew her away, that she invited me to go over to Nigeria. But I look at my life and think to myself that if that young Nigerian guy didn't come over, flying over to London to shake my hand and say, you changed my life, would, that, would I have ever woken up to answer that question? When you leave this world, what will you be remembered for? No, we all need to value legacy in life. That in fact, when you're talking about culture, when you're talking about life, when you want to accomplish something in life, the purpose of your existence means so much, not just to you, but millions of people around the world because you hold a gift. When you're this one in seven billion person in this world, you realize that in fact you are exceptionally unique. And when ex exceptionally unique in this world, the world is crying out for you. The world is crying out for you, asking for you to stand up and make yourself aware that you exist. But we forget about self-discovery. It's one element that we do not give enough focus to, that when we want to go into business, for example, it's a great idea and we need money without even realizing who we are. And there's various different things we need to learn about ourselves, what we want to achieve what, you know, in life, who, we, who can support us, everything, who, what, where, when, why, and how. Six valuable questions we need to ask ourselves. And when we realize we are this one in seven billion and we understand what we're truly here for in this world, you'll realize the whole world comes chasing after you at all costs. Just make yourself feel like you are this diamond, that you are the only piece of diamond there is left in this world. And when you realize that, that makes your price exceptionally high. And so this whole journey that I've gone through in life, I've only just turned 23 years old. And in fact, I don't employ anyone. I don't have an office. Everything I do is mobile. The, the 26 countries that I've traveled to have not cost me a single penny. You know, the books I've written, when I understand about my social circle, you know, the people who have an influence in my life, and in fact, I wrote a book last year called The, the Young Entrepreneur World. And I, in, in fact, it's a bit about my, myself and uh, the people I've met along the way who have had such an influence in my journey to help me get to where I am today. And this book, when I wrote it last year, I've come across exceptional people. In fact, a lot of people told me, oh, Sabirul, you set up your first business at the age of 14. There's a young guy I've come across who I interviewed in my book who started his first business at the age of eight. And I'm thinking to myself, why did I start six years too late? And all that people say, oh, Sabrul, you wrote your first book at the age of 17. And there was a young girl I came across in this book who wrote her first book at the age of four. So again, it put everything into perspective that in fact age is just a number. And there's something I call the seven Ps, which I want everybody to hear. Always you know, be positive. No matter how bad the situation is, have that positive mindset. Next is passion. Do what you want to do, not what somebody else tells you to do. Then perseverance, hard work that you must work hard followed by persistence in life because persistence pays off. Next is purpose, live life with meaning because you want to one day tell your own grandchildren, your children, your story that how you've done this, how you overcome these struggles in life. Next is patience. In fact, I heard my name Sabirul means patience. And the final P is believe in the power of people. And I hope each and every one of you here in this room will be able to use the, the idea of the power of people to be able to make ideas happen and not rely on, on money to be able to make it happen. Because like we've heard before, people are the greatest assets. So I hope I've inspired you all to bring the world at your feet. Thank you very much. <laughs>